Colossians chapter number 3. We're going to begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections, or set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now, by the time chapter number three has come along, the Apostle Paul's already given warning of those teachings which were one wrong, but two would cause division in the church. He's also encouraged them to remain steadfast in the doctrine that they've received. And by the time we get to chapter number three, he's talking about not how the law doesn't have power over us anymore. <clears throat> he's already dealt with that. And he sums it up real nice where he says, if the Lord doesn't give you a personal conviction about it, then don't do it. If it does give you a personal conviction about it, do it. Right? We hear it this way, if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. We're not bound to the law any longer. Right? We don't have to worry about taste not, touch not, wear not, all of those kind of things. So by the time he gets to chapter number 3, he's talking about that liberty and how after we get saved, our perspective should change. So by, in verse number 1, he says, If ye then be risen with Christ. In other words, if you're saved. If you're not saved, this ain't going to do you any good. But if you are saved, you should strive to make this part of your life. He says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. So much of what the world would call religion today is focused upon things on the earth. They judge what you wear, they judge who you hang out with, they judge all these things about you that don't have anything to do with spirituality or more importantly, the kingdom of God. Jesus did a lot of teaching on the kingdom of heaven, what it would be, what it wouldn't be, and it blew people's minds back in the day when he preached it. And I'll be honest with you, it still blows some people's minds today, even though it's been recorded for over 2,000 years. They can't wrap their head around the idea that God has a different way of doing things than man can understand. Or that what God finds is important, man doesn't find important. Well, he says, set your sight, seek those things which are above. Didn't Jesus promise that, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find? Knock and it shall be opened unto you. When the Apostle Paul tells you to seek those things that are above, he means... In truth, if you seek it, you'll receive it. Because he knows that God's not slack concerning his promises. So if you truly seek after those things which are above, you'll attain them. But he says, those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. He says, our goal, our sight, our desire, the thing that we're focused on should be the one who raised us from our death and trespasses and sins. That gave you new life. He's, remember, he says, if ye then be risen with Christ, right? if Christ is the one that gave you new life, then why wouldn't your sight or your pursuit be on the one that raised you from death unto life? He says, seek those things which are above where Christ is seated at the right hand. Is that he already was our forerunner. He forbore our sins, but also he blazed that path a way called straight because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, follow after me. Take up your cross and follow him. Well, in order to follow him, you've got to be looking at him. But in order to stay on course, you've got to be seeking after him. But he says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Now that word affection is an interesting word. It does not say set your goals on things above. It doesn't say set your quotas or the things that you wish to accomplish on things above. He says your affections. 
an affection is something that you love. An affection is where your heart is. And did not Jesus say that where a man's heart is, his treasure will be also? The Apostle Paul is going far past things that you can see, going far past things that you can hold in your hand as possessions. He's saying set your affection on things above. He said put your heart smack dab in the middle of glory. Now if your heart's in glory, what's that mean? You're going to love the things of God. But if you love the things of God, you'll do everything down here that it takes to keep your heart in glory because that's what you find most valuable. Those are the things that are precious to you. It says not on things on the earth. Things on the earth, right, we're just robed in flesh. We're so, we can pretend that we're all high and mighty and special and all of us are real holy, right? But we all still crave things that we can taste, that we can see, that we can hear, that we can interact with. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Every now and then the Holy Ghost will show up down in, deep down in the gable into your soul and he'll have a you know, time of fellowship with you. But in truth, can't see him, can't touch him, can't hear him. You can feel his presence, but right now we have received in part, and one day we'll receive in full. We'll be with him forevermore. But the biggest struggle spiritually is that there's so much around you that is geared towards pulling your attention and your affections away from the things of God. Not talking about wicked, illicit, Right, the sins that even the world would say, oh, that's too much. Right, we're not talking about lasciviousness. We're just talking about things that steal a little bit of your affection here, a little bit of your attention there. And what's it designed to do? To take your heart from heavenly things and put them smack dab in the middle of worldly things, carnal things, things that can be seen, things that can be touched and interact with. Right, we... Don't understand why people expect it of newborns, but then they think people grow out of it. Right? But when they're real young, what do they like? They like things that are bright and colorful. They like things that make noise. They like things that they can hit with their hand and it'll do something. Right? Well, when you get older, the things that make the loudest noises and are the brightest colors and have the flashing lights, they still draw the eye. They still inwardly beg you to go out and interact with it. Because it'll be fun. Well, those things which are in heaven, we can interact with the Holy Ghost because He sealed us till the day of redemption, but I can't see Christ. I can't see the Father. I can't see all the things that will come. I can't see all the things that have been. I know and I believe that they're real, but it's faith versus the things that you interact with every day. Faith is delayed gratification because you believe it's going to be worth something more in the long run. I don't need to see it. I don't need to interact with it. I believe that it's worth living for. But on the other hand, some people want instant gratification. They want their cake and they want to be able to eat it too. Those that have their affection set on heavenly things say, it's not my cake to eat. Everything that goes into what I've labored for, one of these days I'm going to present it to him. Amen. Verse number three, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. We'll come back to that. But in verse number four it says, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now there's three things in that verse that are just as true. Three ways to read that verse. First, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. When Christ comes back, you're going to look just like him. Whether it's through the grave or whether it's through the rapture, you're going to take off this mortal clay and it's going to be transformed, quickened, changed in the twinkling of an eye, and you're going to be exactly as Christ forevermore. 
going to have the same body, going to look just like him. Right? You will be with him in his glory. He'll appear with him, and when he comes back, we're going to be with him on white horses. Right? You will appear with him in glory. But also when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. That's not just how you're going to look, that's where you're going to be. You're going to appear with him in glory. Everywhere that Christ goes from the time that he calls the church out of here, guess where you are? Right there with him. During the millennial reign, guess where you are? You're back on the earth with him. At the judgment, guess where you're at? You're in the audience. There to pay witness. For all of eternity future. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. Guess where you're going to be? Right there with him. You're going to appear with him. Everywhere he is, that's where you'll be. To never be separated ever again. But then, it says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye appear with him in glory. Those that have set their affection on heavenly things, those that seek after Christ, who is seated at the right hand of God, when he appears, they won't appear with him in shame. They won't appear with him in apology for all the things that they should have done. No, those that have their face set towards heaven, that have their heart fixed in heavenly things, when he shall appear, it shall be a glorious reunion. They'll be able to show the fruits of their labor, like the parable where Jesus said that the master went away and he gave three servants a talent. And when he came back, he inquired of them. He told them, go, spend it. Make more money. Go invest it. Become fruitful. First came back, he made one into ten. Second one made one into five. The third one went and buried it and said he knew that his master was a cruel man and a harsh man and that if he went out and he failed, that the master wouldn't have been pleased with him. So he took the one talent and he buried it and he came back with one talent. He called him an idiot because he said you could have at least gone down to the bank and said, here, loan this out to somebody. And then when he came back, he'd have been able to get that plus the interest on top of it. But those that were fruitful, it didn't matter that one got ten and the other one got five. All the master cared about is that they went out and they did as they were commanded. They became fruitful. But we think everything comes down to numbers and how much you've been able to accomplish. God takes care of the increase. He told us to be fruitful and multiply. He told us to let that root that he put in us, right, when he grafted us into the, the vine, that we became alive, we once were dead. But when we became alive, he said, be fruitful. One, let the fruit of the Spirit take root in your life. Let that begin to blossom so that others can look at your life, taste and see that the Lord is good. But in addition to that, he commanded us to go and to win, to make new disciples, to go as the Spirit led so that the Spirit could draw men under repentance. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, and how shall they hear without a preacher? He said, go out and tell them. Be fruitful. Go take that talent that he gave you and invest it. Make more out of it. See, some plant, some water, who gives the increase? God does. You can't tell me that Jeremiah was any less successful than the greatest preacher, that John the Baptist, that's who Jesus said it was, it was the greatest man born a woman. You can't tell me that Jeremiah was any less fruitful or productive or valuable in the eyes of God than John the Baptist just because John had a whole bunch of people that had been baptized and we don't have any evidence that Jeremiah ever had one convert. It's not about the fruit. It's about the labor that you put in. People have to choose to be saved. But you have to choose to go out and be fruitful. A tree's job is to make fruit. Then that fruit falls to the ground. 
And from there on, it's in God's hands on where them seeds end up. Some of them are never going to become trees. Some of them are going to be planted, but then snuffed out because there wasn't enough water or because the sun was too hot one season. But some make their way to a patch of grass that's just right to grow another tree. And somehow, whether through an animal that ate it and then deposited it somewhere else, through a squirrel that took some of those seeds or those nuts and then hid them away and forgot about where he hid them, however it is that God got the seed to where it needed to be, it makes its way to a spot where it can be fruitful and multiply. We're just supposed to be the tree. We're not supposed to keep track of how many apples that we've given out that people didn't take part in or that people didn't take the seeds and put them in the ground. That's not your job. Your job is to, as Brother Buster Kinsey once preached on, to bloom where you were planted. Your job is to be the tree that God wanted you to be. But some people, if we go back up to verse number 2, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Some people, they move their trees to the place that has the brightest lights. They move their trees to the place where they're the most pleasant things to hear, that tickle the ears. But some just purpose that they're going to stay planted right by the living waters, that they're going to let their roots go deep, and that they shall not be, shall not be moved. Why? Because they are planted next to the very thing that gives them life. They're focused on Jesus and glory at the right hand of God, and that's where their heart is. See, wherever your heart is, that's where your roots are going to grow. You want to know why some people, when the world throws a storm at them, or when life throws a trial at them, or when God says, Hast thou considered my servant Job to the devil? Some people, their trees don't get shaken, even though the world around them is having an earthquake. It's because their roots aren't in the earth. They're in things above. There are some trees that their roots, they go very far, but they are very shallow. The thing that keeps that tree up is because those roots cover such a large distance. There are other trees that their roots don't go very far out, but they go very far down. And then there's trees with roots in every configuration. There's some trees that the roots actually come up out of the ground and the tree don't start until after it gets up above the soil. There's a whole bunch of different kind of trees, but all of them got one thing in common that we can see. All their roots are in the dirt. The dirt is known to erode. Dirt is known to have mudslides and landslides or rock slides. The dirt is known to become brittle and dry if there isn't enough water. Jesus said, don't set your affections on things on this earth. Don't put roots down here. Right with the changing of a day, your roots could be in serious danger of coming up out of the ground. Just a strong enough breeze and all those roots that you put down, you're going to find out they weren't strong enough. And the whole tree is going to come over. But he says, if you put your roots on heavenly things, there's always a spring right next to the throne of God where you can have all the what's the word, nutrition, all the satisfaction, all the refreshment. Why? Because He is our life. Look with me again, verse number 3. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. You know why it says set your affection on things? Because that's where your life comes from. He is life. We've already quoted it. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He made you alive into a new creature. He grafted you into the true vine, the living vine. That's when you became alive. Because before that, he's dead. But, after you are alive, why on earth? This is something I don't understand, Brother Rod. Why on earth somebody will trust Jesus to save them, make them into a new creature, and then expect everything that feeds them as a 
new creature to come from the world which is where they were dead but I don't go to a garbage can looking for ingredients to make new tasty food that I go to the pantry I go to the cabinet I go down to the deli and get fresh meat I'm not using the stuff that came out of the garbage can right brother Brian is now retired but you can ask him but Brian wouldn't have made a lot of meals out of the things that he used to haul down there to the rumpke dump there's a reason it went into the garbage can there's a reason that it ended up down at the landfill it's because nobody wanted it and they wanted it so little that they said get it out of my sight I don't want to smell it I don't want to be around it I don't want to see it get it out of here and Brian said okay I'll do it if you pay me and then now he's retired he don't have to do that no more but why on earth would you go down to a landfill and try and find things to live off of well that's what this world should be to those that have been raised in newness of life with Christ there is nothing that can satisfy that can nourish that can help you as a Christian in this earth our help comes from a heavenly place because our life is seated at the right hand of God your health is not con as a Christian is not contingent upon how well you're doing in the world your health is dependent on how well rooted you are in heaven the Bible says you've already been seated in heavenly places that your conversations already been recorded there you are already God's got everything in heaven it's just waiting on you so why wouldn't you want to be rooted at the place that you know you're going to end up I work with a guy his name's Caesar Caesar's a very nice guy Caesar's married he's got kids he works full time job Mazak works part time job at Amazon he's one of the guys that dispatches the drivers and everything but Caesar's got family all over you know Central America Caesar's our international order guy. He speaks Spanish. He deals with all the orders south of the Rio Grande until you get to South America. And there's a lot of them. But see, I mean, Caesar's been in Mazak a long time. Caesar get, I'm sure that Mazak's been good to Caesar, but Caesar also works at Amazon. And I don't know how much, but I do know that a lot of what he makes, it's going to the place that he calls home. It's where his family is. He's got family here, but he's got family there too. And he wants to be good to them. See, you may live in this world. You may labor in this world. You may have to wake up every day and contend with the flesh and contend with the world. But that doesn't mean that this place has to be where you're laying up all of your treasures. Doesn't mean that this place has to be where you realize, right, or you hope to realize what it is that God started in you. If you're a student of the Bible, you're never going to find somebody that reaches spiritual perfection. And then all of a sudden, everything's hunky-dory for them here on the earth afterwards. No, we were promised that we would be despised because they hated him. We were promised that because they persecuted him, they would persecute us. We were promised that the world would try to distract us and deter us and get us on a detour so that we wouldn't live for the Lord. Because the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church of the living God. But if the devil and if hell can convince the church that what they've got is good enough, then the church loses. As long as you're going out and fighting the fight, hell can't stop you. But the moment that you put the sword down is the moment that hell's already won. they can't overcome our Lord but if you let them they'll keep everything that they've got hell enlarges its borders every day that tells me that God doesn't intend those that do go to hell to end up there so he has to make more room for them that means that God said no hell was for the devil and its angels but those that have died outside of the grace of God they have to go somewhere and he has to make a place for them 
that tells me that hell doesn't already have them. They may be children of this world. They may have been born in sin, conceived in sin, sinners by, tra or by trade and by practice and by choice. They may be as wicked as can be, just like if you believe what the Bible says, you was just as wicked before you got saved. But as wicked and as vile and, you know, unrecognizable as they are to us, it tells me that the devil doesn't have them earmarked yet. The devil doesn't own them. If he owned them, they'd already be in hell. They'd already have a place reserved for them in hell. If they belonged to him, there'd be no hope. He only gets them when they've decided for the last time that they're not going to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So many times people think, well, I'm not going to be able to, that person's too far gone. They might be reprobate. Well, that's not up to you. That's up to God. There may be no hope for him. If that was true, there had been no hope for you. So what are you believing in? Well, there's nothing I can do for him, true, but there's a whole lot Jesus can do for him. That's the difference between having your affections set in heavenly places. I understand all of this is going to be burned up with fire one day. As much as I love this building, and as much as I love the house of God, I know that one day it's going to be turned into ash. As much as I enjoy coming here today, I'm going to have something a whole lot better one of these days. I'm going to be with Him forevermore. Amen. And I'm going to be in a house that He built for Himself and those that He loved, yes. that He purchased, Amen. the bride of Christ. All of this around here, this is just temporary. Well, the place that somebody's at spiritually, it's just temporary. Someone's lost. That's temporary because one day they're going to be damned. If somebody today is spiritual, that's just temporary because tomorrow they have to continue to be spiritual. You're saved forevermore, but that doesn't mean that you're always spiritual. Doesn't mean that your affections are always set in the right place. Doesn't mean that your roots are always growing towards heaven. Every now and then they take a U-turn and they start heading back towards this world. But verse number 3 says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When he says ye are dead, he's not talking spiritually. You were made alive. And if Jesus made you alive, nobody can make you dead. So what's he mean when he says, For ye are dead? You're dead to your old selves. You're dead to the world. Once the world knew you and recognized you, it knew that you smelled like they smelled, that you walked like they walked, you talked like they talked. You were one of them. Even though you didn't know everybody in the world, the world knew that you was one of their type. But the day that you received life, you became dead to the world. Nothing in the world made sense anymore. Nothing in the world could satisfy, which is why in the first place you sought after something you had heard that there was something that would satisfy you and you started inquiring about Jesus but when you became alive in Christ everything in the world became dead to you and you became dead to it ye are dead this flesh has gone back to the dust to the dirt from the moment that this flesh took its first breath, it knew it was going to have a last breath. This flesh is dead. It's just waiting on the appointment where God unplugs the power from it. That it's done. Y'all ever hear a car driving down the road and you're thinking, that thing's done. It's still moving right now, but there's coming a day that it's done. That's what this flesh is. It's dead. It cannot have life. Never will have life. It's already dead. It's just waiting on the appointment where it finally admits that it's dead. This world is dead. Don't care about the environmentalist. And my favorite one, Brother Tommy, is where they say there's too many cows now and the cows letting out farts are causing global warming to be worse. 
all the more reason to not be a vegan and eat more of them. But they don't like that argument because it doesn't make sense with their, uh, their argument doesn't make sense when you poke holes in it, they don't like that. But anyway. Right, don't care about the tree huggers. There are trees, they're nice and pretty, okay? Like them big redwood cedars out there and every time I see those things, I think uh, the description about the temple that Solomon built and how he had them cedars brought in and I'm thinking all oh, them pillars and them, them rafters, they'd have been beautiful. But guess what? It's just a tree. One of these days, it's going back to nothing. That God's going to destroy it with fire. I mean, no trace of it left. And then once we see what he's got on the other side, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, not even going to be a memory compared to the beauty that's laid up over there. Won't even retain it in our knowledge. But it's all dead. You don't believe me. I right, just look around. Right now we're getting ready to go into spring. Things may bud. Things may grow. And you're going to get angry when you got to go out there with the wheat whacker and you got to get the hedge trimmers out and the lawn mowers and you're sneezing because the fresh cut grass. Uh, I'm allergic to pollen. And so if I cut the grass, you know, for three days, I'm miserable, Brother Randy. Right? It's just one of the things that it is. But it starts a growing, but guess what? It's not going to grow for forever. It's dead. The sun goes away, the water goes away, the cold shows up, and it all stops growing. If it were alive, it would grow all the time. If it were alive, this world would never come to end. There was a point when it was, back in the Garden of Eden. But when man sinned, sin passed upon all things. Because man was given a commission to guard and protect all things in the garden. And when he failed himself, when he failed God, he failed all things. That's when disease and destruction and animals eating each other and bees stinging you and a whole bunch of other things all entered into the world. Ever since that day, there's been nothing lovely in this world. Everything that has been lovely has been sent to this world from a lovely place called heaven. Go and study it out. The only things that are pure, right, lovely, that are in truth alive were dispatched as either messengers from heaven or God himself coming down to heaven and giving man the thing that they needed most. Today, everything that we love about being a Baptist, it was hand-delivered by God through the ages. didn't come from the world. It had to be given to the world because there was nothing alive in the world to nourish you, to satisfy you, to nurture you as you grew as a Christian. So when he says, ye are dead, he's talking about the carnal man. He's talking about you being dead to the world. But he says, and your life is hid with Christ and God. Now that life is hid. What's he talking about here? He's saying, Brother Tommy, you've been made alive on the inside. The world can't see it. The world still sees Brother Tommy. The world hears you say that, well, I'm new now, I've been changed, I live a different life, but they're always going to be skeptical because they can't touch it, can't feel it, can't see it. They can't lay their hands on something different. Because they're carnally minded. Right? Well, your life, which is hid in you, truly is hid in Christ. Because in Christ is me. You mean, we go over to several points in the Bible where it says that I'm in him and he's in me. I'm his and he is mine. Right? I'm just a part of, much a part of Christ as Christ is a part of me. Because he promised to make me a part of the family through him. Well, why is our life hidden? Because when people see Christ, they see Christ. They don't see me, Brother Randy. Hallelujah, they don't see me. They see him. And when people on the earth see me, really they should see Christ living in me. 
they don't see my life because my life is just an extension of his life I'm hid in Christ when the devil looks at me he may see me but when God sees me he sees Christ why is that because my life is hid inside of Christ he put the Holy Ghost hidden in me why so that he could be made manifest in my life I'm a part of him but he's so much more a part of me but additionally, my life, eternal life, everlasting life, is hid in Christ. I can't see it now. I can't go lay hold on everlasting life. I know that I'm, my soul's alive forevermore. I know that one day I'm going to have a body like his that doesn't decay, doesn't change. It's going to be perfect for all of eternity. But right now, it's hid by faith in Christ. Can't see it. Can't touch it. I know that the Apostle John's already seen me over there because he saw me in glory. But on this side of it, it's hid in Christ. Everything that I desire, all the things that have been promised to me, that he said he's gone to prepare a place for me, and if he goes to prepare a place for me, he will come again and receive me unto himself. All those promises, where are they? They are hid in Christ. Christ is not just the one that saved you. Christ is the one that life everlasting is dependent upon. When we get to glory, you know why people are going to see us in a body like Christ? Because my life's hid in Him. Let me give you this illustration. Long time ago, I think it was Sister Kathy, was looking for an illustration on, on plants that would represent, you know, a picture of salvation. And she said, Brother Jordan, can you help me with this? So I went and I started reading about a bunch of different plants. I don't like reading about plants anymore. But at the time, found out about this tree. It's called a Napoleonic orange tree. Very weird tree. They don't know where the first one came from. Actually, it is a crossbreed of this and a crossbreed of that. And then on down through. But it got to the point that because it had been bred over, so many, it couldn't make fruit that had seeds in it. So the fruit, when it would fall to the ground, there was no seed to make another tree. They could take one tree and cross-pollinate it with this one and make a new tree, but that tree would be the last one. So, that tree, they found out you could take just any old orange tree. Florida orange tree, orange tree from anywhere else in the world. If you take that tree and you dig way down into the roots if you take a piece of the root from the Napoleonic orange tree you go down there you hollow out a piece of its root then you go over to the regular orange tree and you dig all the way down hollow out part of its root and put the root from the other tree into it then you got to bandage it up keep it well watered so that neither one of them roots die but eventually they'll graft into one and then the root from the Napoleonic orange tree will start changing the rest of the roots in the regular orange tree. And all the regular oranges are going to fall off. All the branches are going to look like they're dead. Everything about it is going to say that tree's never going to grow any more fruit ever. But little by little, from the roots all the way up through the rest of the tree, one day a Napoleonic orange is going to sprout on that old orange tree. How did it happen? Well, see, part of something special got added to part of something normal. And that special bit changed the normal into something that looks like the special. Well, what happened when you got saved? Christ put part of himself in you and it changed you. Little by little, you started spouting fruit that Jesus said would be identified with him. Now on the outside, you still look just like an orange tree. You're still the same tree that you were when Jesus grafted himself into you. But the evidence is in what's changed on the branches. I may look like an orange tree, but that's not any old orange. That's a different kind of orange. That kind of orange can only come if part of that tree has been made a part of me. 
My life is hid in Him. What makes you the way that you are? Well, that's hid in Christ. What did He do when He saved you? I don't know. There was a miraculous, there was a holy surgery made with, not with hands, made in the heart, made in the soul. I don't know what He cut away and I don't know what He added. I don't know what the ingredients were or how He did it, but I know that it stuck. And whatever He did, it made part of you part of Him. He said that you were engraved in the palm of His hands, but when you were saved, He engraved Himself in your very soul. And that's what allowed you to change. Everything about a Christian's new life comes from the fact that Christ put part of Himself in you. The only reason that we're accepted in the Beloved is because the Father sees that part of Jesus that He put inside of us, and He sees the finished work, what we're going to be on the other side. He says, eventually that tree is going to look just like this tree. And that's why He finds us acceptable. He knows that one day these branches are going to fall off, that I'm going to be plucked up out of the ground, but I'm going to be planted somewhere else. And when I'm planted over there, I'm going to bloom just like Him. I'm going to look just like Him. And forevermore, I will be with Him. Never ever able to be separated again. But when he says that your life is hid in Christ, you can't point and say, well, that's right there. That's where my strength comes from. That's where my hope comes from. This is where my everlasting and blessed assurance comes from. You can't point and say, there's my anchor within the veil. Within the veil means you can't see it. That it's separated from you. But you still know that it's there. You can't point and say, well, that right there, that's where my help comes from. Well, I can. Right here is where my help comes from. But what gives this power? Oh, the Holy Ghost. Because the Word's spiritually discerned. Well, where is He at? Well, the Bible says that He's like the wind. You don't know when He's going to blow. You don't know when He's going to change directions. And just because He's blowing right now doesn't mean He's going to be blowing in the next minute. Where's He come from? Well... He's a part of this thing called the Trinity. That's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it says that God's thrones are in the sides of the north. What's that mean? It's too high for you to see. You can get a telescope and you can look out into what we call the second heaven. All the stars and all the planets. And all you're going to find out there is that you can look and look and look and you're not going to find anything. Because He's in the third heaven. A place that we can't see. Man once used to be able to see it. That's why I believe it's a whole lot closer than people think it is. Because every time that God's called somebody up into the third heaven, they looked up and they saw Him. One of these days, the Bible says He's going to roll back the skies and the whole world's going to be able to look up and behold Him. They're going to run away from His face, run to the rocks and the mountains and cry for the rocks to fall upon them and kill them so that they don't have to come face to face with God. I know that he's close enough that when someone cries, Lord, help, he can reach down and get them. But you say, point to where he's at. Well, he's right here. They can't see that. But where's that? He's on every page of this book. They can't see that. That's found, that's discovered through the lens and the eye of faith. Where's your life at? Well, it's hidden him. But if my life is hid in Him, why wouldn't my heart be right next to Him? Why wouldn't my roots be growing towards Him? Why would I set my affection on earthly things? That's dead. It's going to be burned up. Even if the Lord does bless the world with grace, because right now everything's been fulfilled. He could come back at any second. All the prophecies been laid up. He's just waiting for more people to get in the family. But if God continues that grace age for however long, you may leave it to somebody and they may leave it to somebody else, but it's all going away one day. Why would we be caught up with the sights and the sounds of the world? That's dead to us. We're dead to it. There's no permanency there. There's no satisfaction there. If it worked, you wouldn't go back and do it again or again and again. Or try something different. 
Because it would have satisfied. I've seen a whole lot of movies. I've never seen one so good that I've said, you know what, that's it. I never want to see another movie again. I'm satisfied. Right? I've read a lot of books. I've never read one so good that I said, you know what, that's it. I'm never going to read one again. Why? Because I'm not permanent. Every day my needs change. I need more from the book of God. Because what I'm getting ready to face is different than yesterday. I'm not enough. See, I'm dead to the world. So my affection should be on heavenly things because that's the only place that my strength, my comfort, and my support can come from. My roots are growing towards heaven because that's where my life is. It's hid in Him. So my roots need to come to Him. He grafted me into the vine so that I'd be a part of them. My roots should be growing to make me more a part of them. But verse number 4 says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. We're all going to be in a glorified body, but some of us are going to show up and they're going to have much to lay down at the Master's feet. And they're going to bring Him much glory for the faith and the effort that they put into living a life worth living for Christ. And others are going to have very little to lay down at His feet. They're not going to bring Him much glory. They're going to bring Him little glory. And they're going to have to look into the eyes of the one that loved them supremely and say why they love the things of the world more than they loved Him. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.